Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, we might make a start. Um, so welcome, everybody, to the second day um, of the Pacific Update Conference. Uh, as one of the organizers, um, my name is um, Matthew Dornan from the Development Policy Center. Um, I'd like to um, thank you all for attending. Uh, to those of you that uh, presented yesterday or are going to present today, um, thank you for making this conference a success. Um, it's a pleasure to be asked to chair this session on the Fiji economy. Um, the first one of these that I attended uh, was um, took place um, shortly after the coup. Um, and at the time, the economy was struggling. Um, investment had plummeted. Uh, whatever the reasons, um, it's good to see that Fiji's economy um, today is in a better place. Um, higher investment, higher economic growth. That's not to say there aren't challenges. Um, there certainly are. Um, and I think Sunil uh, will discuss some of those. Um, but nevertheless, I, I think it's good to see um, some improvement in those, um, those macro indicators. Um, before I introduce the speakers, um, I do just want to take a moment to, um, to note, um, to commend the School of Economics at USP um, for their continued um, analysis and commentary uh, on the Fiji economy. Um, in, in the Australian Public Service, um, where I originally hail from, there's a saying, um, you provide frank and fearless advice. Um, and I think that's very much um, something that the School of Economics has done um, on the Fiji economy um, for many years now, um, through its um, hosting of the Fiji update um, and now um, in this forum. Um, and in doing so, um, it really has contributed to, to um, public discussion about the Fiji economy, um, contributed to, to stronger public um, policy in Fiji, uh, and of course to a stronger Fiji. So we have three presenters today. Um, first off is um, Sunil Kumar, um, who will um, be presenting the survey uh, of the Fiji economy. Um, Sunil um, is a senior lecturer here at the School um, of Economics at USP, um, where he teaches microeconomic theory and policy. Um, he has a PhD in economics from the University of Queensland in Australia, um, and his um, key areas of study are uh, poverty analysis and distribution, um, macroeconomics and international trade. Um, after Sunil, we will hear from um, Rup Singh, uh, who is also a senior lecturer at the School of Economics. Um, he uh, has taught uh, macroeconomics and econometrics um, here at USP. Um, I note he's um, won a number of, of prestigious awards, um, including being joint recipient of the um, Oceana Development Network Research Award in 2011. Um, and um, he was also awarded an honorary fellowship at the University of Western Sydney um, in 2010, where he completed um, part of his PhD research. Um, last, um, we will hear from Arif Khan, who is the founder and the managing director of um, Cocoa Fiji. Um, it began operations um, in 2014 um, and is involved in the farming, processing and trading um, of cocoa beans. Um, and so fantastic to have um, a private sector input um, to this session. So without any further delay, I'd like to um, invite Dr. Sunil Kuma um, to the stage. Thank you, uh, Matthew. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my presentation this morning uh, is basically on the Fijian economy. I'm going to look at uh, uh, some of the uh, current data and from there uh, some of the projections. <coughs> um, uh, I, have, uh, I have given a tone to this uh, presentation. Um, as usual, I have uh, been a critique of the government policies, uh, but of course, <clears throat> um, uh, as usual, we need to uh, provide space for discussion. <clears throat> uh, my presentation has these five uh, uh, components, uh, introduction, uh, uh, then looking at the trends, um, uh, the data, <clears throat> uh, and the prospects, 
uh, I'm looking at the economic uh, sectors and then the key challenges of the economy and some uh, concluding remarks. <coughs> Okay, um, uh, the uh, Fijian economy, I tend to understand it's a microcosm of any medium-sized economy. It has basically uh, all those uh, uh, sectors that you would find uh, in a medium-sized economy. It is, it is not like Samoa or Tonga or Kiribati. Uh, it has a reasonably sized, you know, or reasonable size uh, uh, service sector agricultural sector and the industrial sector. <coughs> um, uh, uh, the agricultural sector, um, the major component is the sugar industry, which um, is contacting, which is a major issue, political issue uh, in the country. And uh, from uh, time to time, you'll find uh, lots of lots of arguments about the sugar industry. <coughs> Uh, there are other uh, crops uh, in agriculture, small industries, small farmers, <coughs> subsistence agriculture is uh, a food security issue in Fiji. Uh, forestry, mahogany and pine are the major uh, products, <coughs> uh, fisheries. <coughs> and then I'm going to look at manufacturing and the other sectors uh, as I have pointed out here. Sorry, this system works a bit slow, I don't know. Oh, oh, all right, uh, the basic problems of the economy. Uh, number one, business environment and confidence in the economy is a big uh, issue. Um, the business environment uh, has been uh, deteriorating um, and the confidence in the economy, although uh, institutions like the Central Bank, Reserve Bank of Fiji would be saying a little bit different, uh, or the government would be saying a bit different. Uh, when you speak to the businesses, you'll find out the real story. <clears throat> Cost of production, low productivity, these are fundamental problems of the economy. Uh, labor resources, uh, resource constraints, lack of skills. And I hear these are uh, the kinds of problems also arising in economies like a New Zealand economy. <clears throat> uh, Cost and unreliability of utility services like electricity, water. These are the issues. Uh, supply constraints of raw materials, a major problem uh, uh, in the current period. And also infrastructure. All right. <clears throat> uh, I would want to uh, relate the Fijian economy with the regional uh, scenario. And if you see in this data, this is uh, ADB data uh, from the Pacific Monitor. Uh, last year's uh, economic growth was, uh, I would put it as poor and, uh, and no fault of the government, of course, or government policies. <coughs> uh, it was basically, it basically happened as a result of uh, Cyclone Winston, uh, which caused uh, depression in the uh, western side uh, of this country. Um, but nonetheless, we are uh, hoping to cope. Uh, and the uh, economic growth is projected at 3.6. <clears throat> um, and if you look at this, it uh, doesn't look too bad uh, for the region. Uh, inflation, I thought i point this out at this, uh, at this juncture. Uh, you can see the uh, uh, inflation in 2016 was pretty high. It's of the, uh, of the tech. It's not like something that we contracted from uh, uh, externally. It is something which is a bit strange because it's internally uh, generated inflation. <clears throat> so uh, as I move on, you'll see uh, why perhaps it would have come around. And one of them, of course, is resource constraints. Um, regional uh, scenario, how do external conditions look? External conditions uh, for Fiji, um, uh, for the near future, for this uh, few uh, quarters, uh, looks fine. I don't think there would be anything uh, drastic happening, really. And uh, Fijian economy should, uh, uh, should pick up. And if it doesn't, of course, some of the things I'm going to point out uh, uh, would need to be addressed. Uh, the Asia momentum remains uh, huge. Uh, 
uh, China is growing at about 6.5%. Uh, um, India has started growing uh, uh, very well, very fast, which is about 7, 7.5%. 7 uh, although that would not have direct effect on the Fijian economy, but the momentum around the region is there. All right, uh, and also global scenario looks good, uh, not too bad. Um, the uh, IMF uh, uh, projections were actually revised upwards uh, recently, so it doesn't uh, look bad in in that uh, in that uh, way. Um, Australian economy is growing at about 2.53 percent, uh, 2.5 rather, and um, uh, and uh, Fiji actually can can uh, uh, make gains from that. <coughs> and and New Zealand economy is also projected to grow at about three. So that's good. All right. Uh, uh, inflation uh, picture, global inflation uh, is uh, leveling off, uh, at least it is projected to level off. So uh, given that the um, uh, oil prices are stabilizing, um, it might be inching up a little bit, uh, but uh, it's not going to affect uh, uh, the Fijian economy so badly uh, in, the, in the short run. <coughs> Okay, uh, regional economies that influence Fiji, and I've uh, pointed out Australian economy is a key one. Uh, a lot of people talk about Chinese economy, uh, but you'll find out if you look at the uh, tourism sector, uh, it's the Australian economy that matters. <coughs> so uh, uh, the growth uh, is at about 2.5, as I've said, uh, and, and we'll see uh, the productivity figures in uh, Australia, and I think Australian policymakers are banking on that. Uh, although the productivity uh, trends are declining in the um, in US, and the US economy actually is slowing down at the moment. <coughs> uh, but but there, there seems to be some momentum in the Australian economy on this front. And for Fijian economy, this is a major issue, the productivity issue. And I'll point that out as we and New Zealand has the same story, and I was pointing out to Matthew about uh, what's happening in the New Zealand economy. The, uh, the uh, productivity uh, momentum that Australia, uh, sorry, New Zealand economy gained some years uh, earlier uh, is moving on, but now it's steaming out. So, uh, so New Zealand uh, will probably have to uh, look towards uh, uh, new policies, uh, productivity and technology policies, and I think it applies to the Fijian economy um, uh, quite well. <clears throat> All right, the uh, con uh, confidence composite and uh, GDP is a major issue. And today, in Fiji, the business environment, as I have said, is not so good. Um, that's what is reflected in the World Bank data. Um, uh, that is what we experience today when you talk to the businesses. Um, they point out uh, problems that are there about, um, about resources, about uh, prices and so on. And availability of raw materials, that's a major thing I'm going to talk about. <coughs> um, uh, in, the, in, the New Zealand, uh, in the New Zealand case, uh, you can see that the, the two are moving together. So I just want to make that point. So it applies to the Fijian economy. Uh, equally, um, this is the this is the statement that comes out from um, the uh, uh, central bank, the Reserve Bank of Fiji, and here it points out according to the RBF's uh, December 2016 uh, business expectation survey, the overall business outlook is uh, expected to remain generally optimistic despite weaker sentiments in both short and medium run. Now, I, I find this a little bit strange because it seems like uh, those policymakers there are not putting their feet on the ground <coughs> or putting their ears on the ground. <coughs> uh, that's the problem. So uh, in my experience, uh, I have multitude of experience apart from academia. I also uh, have experience in business. <coughs> And I encounter this on a daily basis. Uh, you don't get skills. Uh, people are asking for higher wages when you find out 
they are not good enough. And, um, and there are also, uh, over here you see the advertisements is what uh, the central bank relies on in, in picking out the uh, job creation and all that, making statements on job, job creation. It's not, it's not a true reflection of what is happening. <clears throat> because they are repeat, they are repeat, and they are repeat uh, advertisements coming, and, uh, and the central bank keeps counting them. All right, uh, Fijian, um, uh, Fijian growth trend, uh, this is what we see. Yeah, last year wasn't good. Um, uh, you can see for 2014, and we have always said these are consumption-driven uh, growth rates, and it, uh, uh, it shows it uh, fairly uh, clearly out here that uh, 2014, 5.6% uh, uh, government was very expansionary at the time due to elections. <coughs> um, <coughs> Uh, projected growth rate 2016 and beyond, you can see um, they're not too, uh, uh, too, uh, too good as they were in 2014, but remains positive, which some people might want to say unprecedented. That's fine. All right, so I picked on some data, sectoral data. I would want to show some of the sectors. I think that's uh, an important uh, point here. Uh, how different sectors are doing <coughs> and what is expected of different sectors. All right, so, all right. <coughs> so we have um, uh, agriculture here, which is uh, showing <coughs> upward. <laughs> Five minutes. I'm not even halfway. Anyway, <coughs> so, uh, all right, so uh, the sectoral. Um, um, economy is, uh, for instance, agriculture is showing upward trend, uh, which is a good sign, but there are lots of doubts about that. I'll leave the rest. Uh, we would have said sugar industry, but sugar industry, both the prices, uh, price is likely to go down and production is going down. So uh, it's a bit doubtful whether agriculture would be able to contribute any better. All right, there are other sectors. Uh, tourism is going inching up, which is good, um, and I think uh, that is what is sustaining the economy <coughs> in, in many ways, in terms of you know foreign exchange, uh, foreign reserves, and so on. <coughs> Dwellings, I think this is a, an important one. I'll go to the other one. <coughs> uh, new uh, new buildings. Um, this is this reflects private sector uh, investments, private initiative on investments on private properties and so on. And if you look at chart 21. It clearly shows downward trend, and the trend, downward trend, started in 2008 sharply, and then it continues, which puts a huge doubt about private investments in the country. Yeah, same applies to uh, 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 new buildings. Uh, okay, uh, here I'm raising the issue, the question: Does this explain the problems of housing market in Fiji? Those who are familiar with Fiji uh, situation would know it. The rentals, there's, there's a lot of intervention by the government in this sector. Price control doesn't work. And I think I would reiterate, and I've said it uh, privately, and, and I think the, the minister who imposed it needs to come back to this and think again. All right, I'll skip this. All right. Okay, uh, public administration, uh, the green one you can see, uh, is showing a little bit dent downwards. But uh, I, I presume that um, the government is looking towards uh, increasing uh, civil service salaries by around 10, 20 percent. Uh, that would not look like that. It might uh, be different. It might be upward looking. <coughs> um, the rest is okay. Okay, in the sense that it shows trend. Main problem here in this trade sector, all right, quickly, give me five more minutes, please. Uh, <clears throat> the main problem here is the productive sector, which is the exports, all right? And you can see that line, it is going downwards. And that is why uh, the trade gap is just widening. It, it keeps widening, all right? What are the major challenges? The first one I point out is lack of skills. 
Now there's a huge deficit. It is unimaginable. Uh, you ask the businesses, the people who are there will tell you. So labor market reforms grossly lacking. Uh, lots of working days are, you know, huge. Uh, there are huge disruptions. I have talked about attitude. <clears throat> there's a kava attitude, kava culture among men. Women are fine. They don't drink kava, so they come to work. They don't get fall sick so much, and I would love to employ them more. Um, all right, I'll just, uh, okay, some pointers. <clears throat> new market-oriented labor policies are needed. A new uh, uh, legal and uh, procedural mechanisms need to be put in place to deal with industry matters. New constructive in-house training policies are needed. In fact, the FNTC of the past was doing much better than what is happening now. Uh, new and more responsive technology and investment policies are needed. Uh, and also maybe retirement age needs to be reviewed. Broad investments, I have already raised doubts about that. Government investments is fine. Uh, but private initiative, private investment is lacking badly. Even when uh, the financial sector markets uh, look fine. Yeah? Uh, the interest rates are declining and so on. At the moment, it's inching up a bit, uh, but it has been low for uh, some, uh, some uh, years now. All right, just this one <clears throat> I thought was important. Uh, utility, uh, electricity disruption has been phenomenal. And I, I say this here, had this been happening, had that been happening in Australia, the chief of the utility would have been fired on the spot. Here, he survives, keeps on roving around and making parties. Um, <clears throat> natural disasters are there, we can't help much. But I think we have to be more ready for, uh, for mitigating uh, those situations. Um, a scarcity of uh, lack of supply of various uh, intermediate goods. You go, if you are building a house, go ask for cement, you won't get it today. They'll say, wait for three, four weeks. They will say, oh, buy some more things, then we will give you some cement. This is the situation, and it's price control. Uh, ply boards, for the last few years, we have not been getting. This is the situation. Steel, same. <clears throat> mahogany, we have largest stock of mahogany in the world, probably. Yeah? But we, it's a rare commodity in Fiji. In the sense, you go to the yards, there are huge piles of mahogany, but they're not selling it to the locals. Doing business in Fiji is getting worse. <coughs> From uh, 84, it's gone to 97 for a number of reasons. And one key one is the, uh, the credit, <coughs> the credit um, uh, uh, situation where <coughs> uh, the uh, bureau was uh, actually um, disbanded or whatever. And uh, now the banks are uh, more tight and they're not giving out loans as they used to because they, there's so much of uncertainty. And that's to do with government policy. Okay, I'll just skip this. I can skip this, no problem. Okay, land procedures, huge issues for small enterprises. FRICA attitudes are much better today uh, than it used to be three years ago. Uh, but uh, businesses are often harassed. <coughs> Uh, I think I think something's changing there, which is good. FNPF, the uh, supervision fund, they have uh, now put on online procedures, uh, but uh, small businesses, you can imagine, they put fines. If you are a day late in paying your FNPF contribution, you'll be fined hundred dollars per worker. You can imagine what happens to a small enterprise. <clears throat> Accounting and administrating, uh, administration costs for small enterprises is huge. It's huge, unsustainable. And that is why if you look at the data, you'll find it out. Even when, even when our roads and things kind of look fine in this weather, yeah, the weather is getting better now. This is winter. The roads are looking better. Come December, it will be different. But <clears throat> this is where uh, I see... Uh, people having different perspectives, those coming from outside to see the roads, who travel by the roads, and those who are actually experiencing the issues on a day-to-day -day basis. 
There are governance issues, debt issues. Uh, debt uh, is said to be uh, sustainable, but there are some questions. In absolute dollar terms, the debt is increasing, and it is likely to increasing far more uh, next uh, uh, next uh, 12 months coming uh, because of the coming elections. <coughs> Um, just quick points, I guess, on infrastructure uh, funding, and I have said more diligence needed there. Um, uh, all the projects that are there need uh, scrutiny and monitoring processes to be in place. <clears throat> Our health sector is in shambles. Education, uh, I think, needs uh, a lot of um, concerted attention. Uh, but the minister was here, he spoke well yesterday. Um, I'm sure he has started using his mind on these matters. <coughs> the government must pay attention to energizing productive sectors through private sector initiative. And it is not about throwing money or asking ANZ to start, you know, small loans, all this. It needs concerted policy-making effort. It needs experts to come together and start doing something, not politicians. Long-term strategies need to be considered to enhance productive resources. Labor market issues are uh, serious problems now, in the short run, and also in the long run. Um, business environment, I think the government has to rethink where the economy is created. It's not the government that creates the economy. That's what the psychology is. It's the private sector initiative, private citizens of the country that create economy. <clears throat> and approval procedures, it's a, it's a headache. It's, it's cumbersome. You just can't believe it. If you want to build a house on state land, it will take you months to go through procedures. So I, I would stop here for the moment, but if there are questions, I will be most willing to answer them. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Sunil, for that um, detailed, in-depth, um, critical um, survey of the Fiji economy. Um, we'll now hear from uh, Dr. Rup Singh, who will be speaking about urbanisation and sustainable development in Fiji. Thank you, Chair. Um, Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, um, unlike my colleague, I'm not going to dis depress you so much. But I will talk about um, urbanization, which we see and experience every day. Much more exciting, I think, and we'll reserve a lot of questions for Sunil on his presentation later. Um, <clears throat> this area of research has become very, very interesting, not only to geographers and socialists, but also to economists because um, it's something real, it's happening on a day-to-day -day basis and happening around us. When I came this morning here at about quarter to the time before we started, probably a few of us were here. And some of uh, my friends were saying probably we had a lot of grog last night. But I thought many of us would have been stuck into traffic. And that is largely because of such things happening around us. It is, however, not bad. I'll talk about that in a while. There has been a complete shift of uh, thinking in terms of how we view urbanization and growth and development now compared to what we used to do in the past. So that has excited mainstream economists now, people like Robert Solo, uh, Paul Roma, and other, uh, work, uh, other economists with Roma are actually interested in this area. So um, if you are keen on this, I'll point out a few important, interesting literature that you can see through. We knew that modernization promotes development, but it was very late before when we really realized its real impact. I take you to a little bit of background. Initially, the literature uh, put urbanization into a different perspective. It was initially thought as mass movement of people from rural to urban, and that created a list of problems. The literature today uh, categorizes them into four main types of issues or problems. These are crime, traffic congestion, contagious diseases, and of course, uh, expensive housing costs. 
and within these four you can fit in all the other problems that, that we have experienced. I'm not surprised why that was the case because some of the large economies like uh, India, Brazil, Mexico, China even, have had very bad experiences uh, in managing urbanization. So policymakers and theorists and economists like uh, they, they began to categorize urbanization. They looked at it in a very different way. Today, things have changed. We are now looking at urbanization as an opportunity for growth. And I think if you read on Roma's initial work, you'll realize this aptly that urbanization is related to, very, very closely related to growth and of course development because of the impact of agglomeration, scale effects of large population. I'm pretty sure Sunil wants to establish a business where there is people. So we're talking about the, the impact of scale effects. We're talking about knowledge spillover. We want to be located and be closed, close to places where we have technology, where we have institutions, where we have universities or other infrastructure in place. We're talking about creative cities. That is a way to minimize the cost of city expansion. We are talking about uh, smart cities and ethical cities even these days. So many of these things are at the forefront right now. So in a nutshell, we are saying now that urbanization is a driver for economic growth and potentially economic development. However, there are a few important shortfalls in the literature, the recent ones I'm talking about. One, the empirical support is reasonably weak to establish that connection between the urbanization, the pace of urban concentration and economic productivity. Second, there seems to be many theoretical frameworks, so there's no one overarching framework that relates urban processes to the development process. And um, I think uh, when you read Rosie Hensberg's um, survey, he points out the four dimensions. And I think we will pick that up later on in our forthcoming publication, which I'll mention in a while. In addition to that, there has been modeling complexities. Uh, we're talking about space on one hand. We're talking about economy on the other hand. Then we're talking about relating them in terms of productivity. So um, modeling complexity has been there, um, and, and it has really impacted uh, economists to provide some sound uh, analytical uh, findings. And for us, small vulnerable economies, I don't think we have much uh, serious research in this area, which is very much um, quantitative in nature. And in addition to that, it is highly unlikely that we can broadly absorb a lot of findings from the major mega cities and apply them uh, on, on our context. Some of them could be relevant. But I think um, we, we can't benefit a lot from that experience. So what we do in this paper is we situate um, urbanization as a factor to promote growth. The structure of my presentation is as follows. Um, I'm going to quickly do a synthesis of the literature, show the modeling framework, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to contest if there are other frameworks in place and, and of course discuss what are some of the issues in these. I'll test on three Pacific economies because we're talking about the Pacific here, uh, but I would anticipate that we can extend on this and give you some brief findings of what we've got and suggest some improvement in modeling, which is also in our forthcoming publication, and of course discuss some implications for policy. We started reading on urbanization, and I think we can classify them into three types of literature. One dates back to the 1900s, but all those literature up to 1980s, purely developmental based. We have socialist kind of views in here, um, talking about the good and bad of urbanization, but looking at urbanization as a process. Not so much linking it to growth, but there was a handful of uh, important works in here which tried to promote that urbanization is important. Otherwise, we have noted that uh, people begin to cite so many issues or problems related to urbanization. And I think many of, this, uh, of us who are here in this room and others 
uh, when you talk about this topic, few things come into our mind. And one of that, which is the forefront, is the problems of urbanization. I think this part of the literature emphasized a lot on those problems. The second wave um, was when economists and geographers began to talk to each other much more often, I think, because in the first they did not. Um, and this is where there was expensive um, work, extensive work done, and then the consensus was that it promotes growth and therefore development, although empirical evidence was lacking. The third and more exciting round is by um, Paul Roma and Edward Gleiser. And I think if you read on this, it may change your perspective on this topic, urbanization. So uh, bringing the two schools together, economists and geographers, economists are interested in productivity, growth promotion, and relating that to urbanization, we're talking about infrastructure, we're talking about creative cities, smart cities, we're wow. talking about scale effects, we're talking about effective demand, and finally we are talking about getting the policies right to ensure that the infrastructure is in place and other institutions work to create the positive impact of urbanization. Geographers, on the other hand, uh, mostly concentrated on space matters. How we can manage space to uh, really see the impact of urbanization and growth. And s somehow they have now begun to appreciate what economists would like them to say. And I think broadly both schools are now converging to the view, the view that if we do harness the city development, we will end up in a better state of affairs for everyone. So what are we thinking now? I think in the recent, most recent literature, 2016-17, some of which I've identified down there, we are saying that urbanization is an opportunity. And I'm uh, very mistaken by uh, Paul Romer's idea on charter cities, although there, are a lot of contention around this. And uh, Roma uh, begins to predict that the uh, global urban population will rise three folds in the next 100 years or so. Which means like um, some large cities, Mumbai for example, where we have 14 million people in the city will become 45 million. And half of them are currently living in squatters. That will go to about 21, 22 million in the next uh, 100 years or so. We can continue to imagine what kind of implications will that, will that have. So large cities will have tremendous problems, but small cities will also not be saved too much. We are 54%. If you look at Fiji, our concentration currently is 54% uh, uh, rate. And we're expecting this to grow. And later on, I'll give you some figures as to what we expect it to be optimal and, in, and when. So a lot of things need to change. Um, there are two ways in which we can do that. One, city expansion. For large cities, this may look a bit hard. For us, there is some scope for expansion. Um, we really haven't gone vertical, but there is scope to do that. That's why when you, when you see developments coming into the city right now, uh, people are uh, demolishing uh, 40, 50 year old buildings and coming up with uh, two, three floors right now. And I'm very excited by this development which has taken place just out uh, beside the McDonald's in Nandi. If you've been to Nandi recently, uh, I think 10 or 12 story uh, motel supposed to be, um, which, is, which is coming up. So we are going to see more, more and more of that. Uh, we're going to expand vertically. But I think uh, at this point, a city like Suva has tremendous scope to grow horizontally as well. We can expand city not only uh, vertically, but we can create new cities. About uh, 15 years ago, okay, Uday, I'm, I'm sure he's around. Uday and I, we used to meet um, in the opposite shop, fetish shop. And none of us imagined that there would be a sports city or the motor city here. Okay, really, that's not a definition of a city. It's an urban space where people converge on a daily basis. And if you uh, do a survey, you'll find the pace of convergence is faster here than in other places. Nobody imagined 
about uh, the Nakasi area, which is now going to become a city. And um, even convergence in there is fast. So we have space at this point in time, if we look at the broader Suvano Sori corridor in Fiji, to, ex to extend and, and create new urban places. That will ease pressure. And the kind of pressure that we have on urban infrastructure, I don't need to uh, detail on that. Everybody feels that on a daily basis. So in the literature today, nobody bothers about um, what traditional literature was talking on. For example, uh, the problems of urbanization and all that. I think we know that very well. And I think we should have learned from it. What we are doing about now is how do we enhance the city? Okay, as I've told you, we're looking at policies on management of the city space, city size, expansion, which way, why, and how. And currently, uh, we're looking at the growth effect of this, and that is where the study is situated in. A few people doubt this. When I think Roma made his first presentation in 2012 about charter cities, a lot of people began to, to um, make different kinds of comments on, on, on his proposition. But Roma thinks that there is a window of opportunity. In this process, if you look at the case of Fiji, calculations show that we will optimize at around 78% concentration. Currently, we are 54. So there is a window of about 24% additional concentration in space, uh, sorry, in city space. That is where the demand will be. And that creates an environment for investment in all different things that we can imagine. But the problem that we will face is on infrastructure. And I'm going to talk about that in a while. The empirical tests, uh, Henderson's work in early 2000 um, showed some positive effects. But the tests were not so strong, although the number of countries in his test were very good. There were others which showed mixed results. Blooms and Harvey's, even Harvey's finding, they didn't find anything meaningful when they related um, urban concentration to economic productivity. But most of these uh, empirical works, they cited a few things. One was weakness in empirical specifications. And I think this dates back um, to uh, the growth literature, the empirical growth literature, where we have been talking about this for, for some time. The other um, important aspect in modeling has been, in this area, on using heterogeneous sample. Okay. Data issues, how to measure this, this um, urbanization. And then the bigger issue is how we link that to productivity. Why will urbanization impact productivity? Well, creative, smart cities, well-planned infrastructure, will promote technology, innovations, uh, research and development. The proximity and interaction will create advancement of knowledge and therefore will enable to reduce the cost of doing business. So what I did initially was this, we have uh, moved on with this. Um, I'll show you in a while what we have recently done, but the results are not so ready for me to present here. I'll give you some brief results. Um, we've used the solo model um, with annual data to deal with some of the identification problems and control for reverse causation, because obviously there could be both uh, causation both ways. Use London School of Economics, Henry's method, with time series. Use indicators of urbanization, concentration ratio, urban productivity, or development expenditure. And um, this is what I, I want to emphasize at this point. In the initial framework of SOLO, um, this, this term A, which resembles technology, Right, is exogenous. It grows at some exogenous rate. And that rate, we just do not know. Could be anything. Okay. We think that if urbanization has any impact on growth, it should impact productivity. And so if it does, it should impact this exogenous constant. So you make it a function of urban concentration, you may say, or urban infrastructure uh, expenditure or whatever it may be. And then um, the uh, IRDL of this would be as follows. I don't need to bother you with all this. Some brief findings on this. 
Um, we have used two stage instrumental variable for the three countries to deal with reverse causation, although um, not very strong results. This indicates that urbanization in the context of Fiji will promote growth. In the context of Vanuatu will also promote growth, but in the context of Solomon Islands, it has negative implications. Why is that? Well, probably it's because of the weak infrastructure and the lack of connectivity to the urban markets. You can expect positive impact of urbanization when concentration has reached to some level. And in the Solomon Islands, around 30%. So I don't really see a large impact of that. We're, sh we're able to see some negative impact because of the reasons I've identified. In the case of Fiji and Vanuatu, seems to be positive, but this needs to, manage, to be managed. In small economies like ours, we lack capacity. Believe me, um, the next government budget and the ones to follow up to 2025 will carry a very strong component of investment in urban infrastructure. We cannot um, get around that problem. But with that, we need long-range development planning, which seems to be missing. There are a few improvements that can be made to the modeling. And I think after reviewing the literature and doing some initial work, we have come to a consensus that a few things can be done. And I'm, I'm very optimistic that we'll be able to do this. But this time, with a massive number of countries across uh, the, the world, particularly using um, few indicators, but I'm reminded of Dreher's work in 2006 when he created um, an index of uh, governance, or globalization, sorry. Something similar to that, I think, which will, mo which will, which will uh, model the urban process, that can filter into the function and from there we can work on it. We tried with a few control variables, but we could not get much results. I think we need to improve on that. The other important test is on fragility, and I think we need to do that. The literature says that we need homogeneous sample of countries. I think we need countries above 50%, at least 50% urbanization concentration, and then we pull them together to, uh, in a global data set to do the work. I want to show you this. In the early 1990s, urban concentration was around 40%. Now it's 54. There's a steep, oh sorry, um, a, systematically, a systematic increase. But our industrial output has not. The gap is enlarging. We think that services sector can deal with that gap. The answer is no. Our economy depends on the service industry. That's correct. But our industries are not so strong to support that service industry. So we'll end up with a situation where we will import a lot of things to, um, to serve our services sector. I don't know the real growth impact of that, what will happen. I'm taking two more minutes. So what do we need to do? We need to create city space or we create new cities, ones which are smarter, based on long-range planning. How long? Well, 70, 100 years. Look at a few uh, figures here. Current concentration, 54%. If you look at our infrastructure, that was done in around 1970s with a modest uh, 2, 2.5% depreciation. In addition to what we have improved on that, the remaining life is about 8 to 10 years. That's why many of these infrastructure and facilities that you are seeing is giving up now. So we need to change that. If you look at the concentration, the minimum you can take is 1.5 of the demand. So that actually means that whatever amount of dollar amount that we, that we compute will have to actually grow by 44% to support the optimal concentration, which is estimated to be about 78% of the urban population or oh, sorry, of the total population of the country. And in terms of calendar years, that, that will be around 2017. Now, you can 
look at that as a doomsday if we don't invest or start investing seriously into this. But this is 2017. We're looking at about uh, 53 years. That is the window of opportunity for growth if you're looking into it. So that kind of investment is required, but that also uh, creates opportunity for uh, investors, for um, development of business or whatever it may be. But the bigger question is on financing. And I think I will stop here, okay? Because financing this development will be massive. How we deal with that, I think I'll leave it to the policymakers to decide as to what would be the best mix of getting the funds to deal with that kind of massive expansion, which is required. Thank you. Thank you very much for that fascinating um, presentation. Um, we'll have questions at the end, so um, I'll, I'd like to now invite um, Arif Khan to the stage. Good morning, all. <coughs> um, the uh, topic I have over here today is uh, marketing and exporting uh, cocoa from Fiji. <coughs> it's a more of a visual presentation. Uh, uh, so, cocoa, cacao Fiji, uh, the cocoa beans is commonly known as cacao in uh, the rest of the world. It's a product which is used by uh, chocolatiers. So I'll give you a little background about myself before I uh, get into this presentation and uh, how we got to uh, starting Cacao Fiji. Around 2012, I was in Reiki Reiki. I visited a um, MPI office just to inquire about prospects of getting into the agricultural business in Fiji. Uh, before that, I lived in the uh, United States, in California, for about 20 years, looking to come back, happy with the government's policy of dual citizenship. And we came across um, stacks of cocoa beans sitting over there, rotting. So I inquired what, what was the reason uh, this was happening. And I was told that the buyers were very picky. Sometimes they would buy and sometimes they wouldn't. So a light bulb went on. I was from a different background, but I hurried back to California, to San Francisco, to inquire about what were the uses of uh, cacao. So coincidentally, during the same time, there's a, um, there's a growth of artesian chocolatiers in San Francisco and the Bay Area. These are chocolatiers, small chocolate companies, not to Big Cadbury's or <coughs> Giardelli. Uh, they were making dark chocolate uh, from uh, cacao from different uh, countries and marketing it as single origin cacao. So I talked to, some, uh, I talked to the chocolatiers, particularly one in San Francisco, uh, Dandelion Chocolate. And my wife and I, we enrolled into a chocolate making process to understand what the end user wanted. So with that information, I came back to Fiji in 2014, presented to Ministry of Agriculture the potential for reviving cocoa. And coincidentally, at that point in time, the minister was also pushing for the revival and the rehabilitation of uh, uh, cocoa industry in Fiji. So with that presentation, I was grateful to ministry for giving me a tour of the vast acres, I'd say hectares, of old and abundant cocoa farms in Fiji. So with that, we started in late 2014. We acquired an abundant, but the most productive cocoa farm, which is in Draketi, 
I hadn't been to the north before that, but I saw three ingredients which uh, appealed to me. There was people who knew about cocoa, they had a product, and these people, they knew the process, which was key ingredients uh, for me, uh, knowing that I didn't come from a cacao background. So now I'll move forward with my presentation and give you a little background about what uh, Cacao Fiji has done. I said that my presentation would be more visual. <laughs> so I'll introduce you to some of our potential buyers. This industry revival, it's key to have a market-driven revival. So understanding the chocolate making process, we were easily able to connect to our buyers, our potential buyers, who are dark chocolate uh, makers and artesian chocolate makers. So this is Hogar chocolate. You can see Matasawa Levu, Early Harvest 2016, Fiji, dark, dark chocolate 73%. So it's important to know, see there's a growing uh, demand for dark chocolate due to changing consumer tastes. Your regular chocolate has very little cacao content. You're looking at about 20 to 30%, a lot of sugar. But the market is now demanding for more darker chocolates, which actually is very beneficial to your health due to the high levels of antioxidants. So there's a wave of this industry coming, not only in San Francisco, but even in France, Canada. We have even shipped samples to Spain. Iceland. Now we move on to France, Chapon chocolate. We've just sent him another big shipment, which is about to reach him. So I met this gentleman by attending the International Cocoa Awards in France, where we did get a recognition of top 50 beans out of 146 samples worldwide, which is very important. Uh, as far as penetrating the market. So as far as France is concerned, we actually have a one very big buyer who will be visiting very, uh, Fiji very soon and I've informed the Ministry of Agriculture that this is a large buyer. They won't be just buying one container. <laughs> they would be buying uh, multiple containers. We need to get together and brainstorm how we will position ourselves. Uh, but that's, I'm still waiting to hear from them. They've been great, but certain times, I think they are missing the point. We have different motivations. We are driven by profit or be driven to supply, driven to revive the industry. Map chocolate, I dream of Fiji. We have a few buyers in the US due to my me being uh, living over there, able to connect to them. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, these buyers are waiting for our cocoa beans. There's a waiting period because of the fact that uh, we have created a demand that we are not able to supply. That's a good situation, uh, but we have to be careful at the same time. And this is how a dark chocolate looks. It's quite different uh, to your milk chocolate or a Cadbury. So this, this is one of our buyers in um, Canada. You can see Fiji, 87.8%, 80, Draketi Madhuata. So we are promoting Fiji worldwide, globally, creating a name for our cacao. I mentioned to you about Cocoa Awards. In 2015, we are uh, invited to participate in the International Cocoa Awards in France. And our cocoa was um, selected in the top 50 out of 146 entries worldwide. And this is the first time where Fiji participated. Obviously, this opened up to a lot of different markets. And we have shipped samples. The process is you ship the sample. They require about three or four kgs. And they process it. And they go to a vigorous process of uh, testing. And if your samples meet their standard, then they will get back to you. So we've been pretty successful with that, uh, thanks to the International Cocoa Awards. So this year, in 2017, we've actually made sure that uh, we have a network of farmers we work with. We have submitted one of the samples for the farmers.
history of cocoa farming in Fiji. Yeah, we have a deep history. I'll need to dig into those notes. Uh, <clears throat> so this was introduced. Um, as you see, uh, if you look at the coat of arms, um, we were passionate about cocoa. Uh, we actually have the lion, must be a British lion, holding the cocoa pod, uh, sitting on top of uh, the sugar in the sugar cane and the coconuts. So there was high hopes. Uh, but I want to assure them there's still hopes. <laughs> So it's interesting to note that actually this was introduced um, uh, via Trinidad. Uh, actually, one of the varietals is called Trinitario uh, in uh, 1798. So it's deep history. Actually, this makes cocoa uh, one of the oldest of the three beverages in, um, in Fiji. So let's look at uh, what kind of um, real estate was allocated to cocoa. Uh, actually, uh, it was pretty impressive. Uh, between uh, 1991 to 1994, you see that Fiji cocoa industry peaked at about 3,500 hectares. That's, that's a lot of land allocated to cocoa. And, uh, oops. So it is a combination of uh, actually uh, big projects, um, which is uh, still existing, but they have very large trees. Um, so this is Kambuna in Savu Savu, uh, islands like Kiowa, Senganga, Bua, Reki Reki. Uh, so there's actually hope. Um, instead of running these big projects, which is run by the government, what we are trying to uh, convince the government to do is actually come up with a system of um, allocating uh, say five acres or ten acres to small holders, small holder farmers, um, which which we actually found it to be very successful. Uh, we have a group of buyers in uh, uh, Dama, which is in Bua North, and we are dealing with about 40 farmers. We are regularly buying wet seeds from them. Uh, so that, that model has actually worked out very successfully. So the question is uh, to meet up with the increase of dema demand. Uh, uh, am I going to be able to get Ministry of Agriculture to sit down and have a brainstorm session and uh, come up with a strategy that this is the way forward? They have acknowledged it, but it's just a matter of time, uh, you know, sitting down and having that discussion. So let's look at uh, cocoa bean production. It peaked at... Uh, around uh, 1985, between 1985 to 1988 at uh, 450 tons. And uh, at, at its peak, it had 2,400 farmers. So, uh, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a ramification of that. There is a multiply effect uh, when you have 2,400 families, <coughs> uh, especially when you're considering uh, areas like Reki Reki, uh, and you know, coincidentally, most of these cocoa farms are in areas of um, high poverty and high unemployment. So th there is a need to revive these farms. And some of them are actually also sitting in the, um, uh, in the cane belts. So this is a, a viable alternative uh, for uh, sugarcane farmers who are facing difficulties uh, with the pricing and the high cost of labor. One thing with cocoa plantation, I'll tell you, is that once you plant a tree and it grows, it starts giving you fruit in three years, and it will give you fruit for the next 20 to 30 years. There are two fruiting seasons. Uh, what you have to do is just maintain the tree uh, to optimize the yields. So when we started in uh, Draketi, this, this is the kind of trees we were dealing with. So a lot of labor was involved into shaping these trees. So we look at the government projects which was initiated in 1960s uh, when the government made efforts to establish cacao as a smallholder crop interplanted with co uh, coconut. It was very successful. Um, 
and there were issues uh, related to um, the market uh, access and uh, there was actually uh, only one market which was the national marketing authority coupled with the um, uh, political instability uh, in the 80s as well as the decline of the prices which led to the demise of uh, the cocoa industry so we are actually a, a private uh, organization uh, I think we are dri driven by different motives so it's important to diversify your uh, your market access in order to have a holistic revival So the, uh, I want to talk about the varietal. I have a lot of pictures. I think they'll make it more interesting and give you an insight of what we are doing. Um, so you can see the cocoa pods over there. This photo was taken last week. Um, we have our walkers over there uh, breaking the pods. It's a very labor intensive walk um, in high unemployment areas. So actually when you're talking about uh, minimum wage, I think you need to be cognizant of the areas as well. I don't think you can have a blanket minimum wage for all over Fiji. There, there are people dying to have a job in certain areas. So Forestro, Forestero Amelanado was introduced um, after Trinitario due to a better disease resistance. So this actually, I said this photo was taken in a model farm in Draketi, uh, where we, ha we harvested 4,000 pods uh, in that week. That actually converted, just give you some perspective, it leads to approximately 400 uh, kilo of wet seeds and $160 of uh, dry cacao beans. So the farm we acquired is actually 400 acres at its peak. It was producing 100 tons. So that was government funded, a lot of labors, 50, 60, we can't afford to do that. So we are taking it uh, in a smart approach uh, whereby uh, we so far have uh, rehabilitated uh, 20 acres of that big project. So the key was to keep expanding as the market expanded, you know. But uh, we also want to, actually our model now is really to work with farmers. This is a photo of our packaging. The production remained fairly uh, constant while it peaked at an all time in 1987, 468 tons, so 1987 was when we had our first coup and government policies changed. So there's a lot of uh, farmers who are bitter, you know, when we go and see them is because when the coup happened and the policies changed, they were left hanging. Nobody to buy their beans, it's the same scenario, taking it to the Ministry of Agriculture to Lambasa and on the way back they were throwing it on the Lambasa river. So these are the challenges we are facing when we go and talk to them, we have to convince them. Okay, why do you need to do cocoa farming? Because we are here and we are prepared to buy all your cocoa, but we won't buy the dry beans because you know we have an obligation to our buyer who needs uniformity in terms of the quality. We will take your wet beans and we will centrally process them uh, to ensure a uh, standard quality. So yeah, the, the discussions are still taking place, as you can see over here. There's a lot of uh, carver sessions and trying to convince them that, hey, we are here to stay. We started in 2014 and uh, I have to personally go and give them the money. It's, it's a lot of confidence building, you know, that, uh, hey, uh, this, this is an industry which will be revived. Uh, go to farming. If you want to do contract farming, we are here. They are skeptical. Uh, but we are confident and we are, uh, we'll be pushing along. So in 1994, 2400 farmers were cultivating about 3,300 hectares on two main islands of Fiji. Today we have about, I say lucky if we have 300 farmers. There's about 247 in Reki Reki and uh, it's about 40 in uh, Mbua. Decline in cocoa production. Uh, yeah, there's some challenges. Uh, this is when uh, you have heavy rainfall, uh, which coincidentally is uh, just um, before our harvest. Uh, so the pods turn black, you know. So you have black pods disease and canker. Um, the aging trees, which leads to uh, low average yields of 41 kg per hectare, this is very low. Uh, 
That's a photo of uh, fermentation. As you see, we monitor our temperature to ensure there's uh, uniformity in fermentation. So we have electronic monitoring. That will be very hard for farmers to do, you know. So we are very cognizant of these details to ensure we have the highest quality. <coughs> So the MPI and the minister is making a push for the revival of cocoa the last few years. Um, you know, they've increased the budgets to 300 to 500,000. I hear that it's going to be a million this year. Uh, so I appreciate the minister's uh, efforts. But, you know, we have, some, we have some problems. We have lack of knowledge base. You have lack of technical expertise in cocoa. We don't have technical offices dedicated uh, to, to this uh, farming. Those who are just waking up and thinking about how I can make that pod not go black. Uh, so when we're talking about a technical officer, one day he's talking about cocoa and then next day he's on rice farming. So if you're going to allocate a million dollars, <laughs> we need two dedicated technical offers, offices, one in Viti Levu and one in Vanua Levu. So I've been crying for this, uh, still yet to come. So we are just floating, uh, trying to connect. <coughs> So we, uh, we want to come up with a strategy of empowering more smallholder cocoa farmers and connecting farmers to market access and giving them assurance there is market access. And we're looking at it on a global perspective. Yes, there is a pent-up demand for cocoa. So future of cocoa in Fiji. This is myself in France uh, accepting that award. I think we have a bright future in, uh, of cocoa in Fiji. Uh, and coupled with the fact that government has renewed its interest in reviving cocoa for the last uh, few years. I think uh, we can get on the right track, uh, but we need to have an active form of communication via an association. The association uh, needs to be effective. Uh, major problems are aging trees, lack of technical knowledge, as I've stated, you know. What are we doing to address those? <coughs> so currently, a lot of that funding is going towards re rehabilitation. So buying chainsaws or pole saws and having mobile team and rehabilitating that farm, which is good. Uh, but, you know, we need to uh, also ensure that there's uh, market access for these farmers. They need to be incentivized. At the end of the day, they will only farm if somebody will come and buy their cocoa beans. And that is what Kakao Fiji is proposing to do. So this is a brief uh, snapshot of um, the uh, increase of price. It's about uh, 2100 as depicted over there, 2200 US dollars. I'll just wrap up another minute. Uh, yeah, this is our current operation. As you see over there, the cocoa beans are drying. Uh, customer is, uh, the consumer is preferring sun-dried beans uh, instead of um, smoked beans. So we are working with uh, approximately 40 farmers. You literally go out in the field over there and uh, weigh the wet, ski, uh, wet beans. And uh, they need to see the money right away. <laughs> I wanted to set them up with a system where we will uh, deposit into their uh, BSP account, but they didn't. So we have actually acquired uh, some land in Ra, Reki Reki, uh, just waiting for the lease uh, to, to build a processing center so we can provide market access uh, to 247 farmers. Uh, we've actually got uh, farmers in our model farm in uh, Draketi, Vanua Levu, and trained them, and we propose to do the same thing. Uh, some of the subsidy could be directed towards that and we could actually hire technical officers to do ongoing training. So these are some of the people we wo who work for us in Vanua Levu. Like I said, this is Joeli, is a very successful farmer in Reki Reki, he's in the, uh, in the islands and you can only access him via the boat, so we go out and meet him. Uh, but you know, they, they want market access. So we are providing it to them right now from the 300 farmers in the next five years we want to deal with a thousand farmers uh, that is feasible because we are in the grassroots you know again as i said that the farmers will farm if they are incentivized so actually we need to work together this is a big project with the ministry and a uh, happy small holder farmer is the key to a uh, successful revival so this was about three weeks ago we went to Rock of Waka, which is uh, past Nalawa, bordering Televu, uh, to buy some beans and pay them cash. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, um, Arif. Great to um, have a such a positive story. Um, 
connecting farmers in, in poor areas like Bua to, to high value um, markets. Um, so we have uh, a little under 15 minutes for question. We might go uh, just a tad over. Um, we've had the full spectrum of presentations from um, Sunil's rather pessimistic um, take on the Fiji economy to um, uh, to Rup's, uh, I guess, cautious optimism uh, about the future of urbanisation in Fiji, um, and to that last presentation, which really was, uh, I think, very positive despite the, the challenges um, that Arif outlined. Um, so we might take a few questions. Uh, I'm sure we'll have um, quite a few. Uh, okay, so these two at the front to begin with, please. My, 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 name, my name is uh, Humphrey Chang, private sector. And my uh, question is, uh, I'll start off with the last speaker first, and then uh, Sunil after. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Khan, the uh, potential for cocoa, as you say, seems to be uh, quite good. But uh, what can we do to the sugarcane farmers who are not doing well? Can we not ask them to do cocoa farming instead of sugar farming? I mean, not. I'm not going to say take all the land, but uh, at least part of the land. And what is the worth or the value of the cocoa industry in Fiji? I mean, is, is there a possibility that we can overtake sugar or not? Maybe not. Anyway, that's for you to, 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 to answer. And to Sunil, we heard a lot about productivity. Uh, it's talked about so many times and so often. But what are we doing about it? I know Sunil is just one person who speaks about it, and he's uh, from the university, but this is a national issue. And the national issue must be headed by good leadership from the, from the country. Can we not start, I, I mean, some years ago, I put together a paper about forming an association. That's a small issue. Someone suggested that we should have a productivity commission, like they do in uh, places like Singapore, USA, Canada, etc. What's stopping us from doing that? Is that a leadership problem? Or can the university make a break and make a start on forming in a, a commission somehow? Have a go. All right, thank you. Um, and we'll take a, a second, um, a qu question from a second person, Stephen. Hi, thank you. Yeah, they were great presentations. Um, I wanted to ask Sunil about tourism. You focused on the Australian economy, but in actually in Australia now, Chinese tourists are uh, the biggest source of tourist revenue. So massive uh, growth over the last 10 years, you know, more than uh, tripling the number, and they're big spenders as well. So what is Fiji doing enough to attract uh, tourists from China? And uh, Rup, I wanted to ask you, what are, you mentioned the charter cities idea favorably, but has that taken off? Uh, are there any examples actually of these charter cities that Paul Rome has been promoting now that he's uh, chief economist of the World Bank? Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, and is there a third question? Um, here at the back. Thank you, uh, Megan Chisholm from Care International. Thanks for the presentation on the cocoa farming. I really enjoyed it. Um, my question for you, Arif, is around the gender dimensions of cocoa farming in Fiji. So I was pleased to note that you and your wife had gone together to learn about the chocolate business. Um, and what we've seen in, in other places we're working, such as in the coffee and cocoa industry in Papua New Guinea, is you often have a family business model where men and women are playing different roles, but very much working together in the business. Um, so I wondered what the gender dimensions are of the, the cocoa farming in Fiji and um, any reflections you have around um, working with both men and women in that, that program, or in, that, in that business. Fantastic, thank you. Um, uh, Arif, would you like to begin, please? And, and um, answer whichever question you, you feel uh, you're best placed to, and, and please do keep your answers as short as possible so that we can have a few more questions afterwards. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, I'll actually answer your question first. Uh, as far as gender, uh, you know, in our farm, in our model farm, uh, we have actually found women to be good workers. Uh, we actually uh, do have, as Sunil has mentioned, a cover problem with the males. So uh, we actually like to employ them because they are more regular. Um, they care about their uh, their families, and it's not uh, once the tree is pruned, it's not really hard labor. So it's just pruning. So I'd say that in our farm, 50% uh, of our workers are female. Uh, I can't really uh, say much about the smallholder farmers because generally I'm meeting uh, uh, a mix. I'd say it's about 70, 30%, 70% male and 30% uh, female when we do go out and buy from them. Uh, so Mr. Ch Cheng, right? Mr. Humphrey, yes. Uh, I think I've forgotten your first question. Uh, but uh, did you say the value of cocoa in Fiji? Uh, okay. I do remember your second question. Which you said With regards to cocoa as a replacement to rice in Fiji. Oh, replacement to sugar. Oh, sugar, sorry. <coughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I would say it's actually, uh, it's not an alternative, but uh, it will certainly complement, um, and we are really encouraging uh, farmers in the the areas, uh, because it needs to be in the mid-zone climate, with a certain amount of uh, millimeters of rain, to start. Uh, and coincidentally, there is cocoa farms in those areas. So we are encouraging them to start rehabilitating, so we'll buy from them. As far as um, the value of cocoa in Fiji and a significant player, I think we did start out uh, with uh, good uh, intentions of it being a uh, uh, viable economy uh, driver. Uh, but uh, and, and it is for the islands of Solomons and Vanuatu. It, it's, uh, they have a um, uh, big uh, number of smallholder farmers. Uh, so we, we, need, we need to sit back and uh, have a strategic discussion uh, instead of... Uh, I always ask them when they're dispersing the uh, funding for COCO, uh, at, least, at least get some feedback from the private sector. I think if we can reach a thousand in the next five years, uh, then uh, with a uh, serious discussion and a strategy and a blueprint, uh, then uh, I think we'll be ambitious. Uh, but we could try to get 10,000 farmers in the uh, the following decade. Then you're talking about uh, some serious impact uh, in cocoa uh, in Fiji. Yes, please, Rob. Thanks. Uh, uh, let me just add a bit on Arif's. Um um, uh, understanding on the value of cocoa in Fiji. Um, if you look at national accounts data, I don't think it is even 1% at this stage. But we should not discount small micro enterprise, uh, small medium enterprise businesses. I think the way in which growth policy is now evolving is we are looking into that. And I think yesterday uh, Professor Gounder presented the willingness of people in the agricultural sector to move into others, and more particularly into, from the sugar, and probably they could diversify into this as an option because of uncertainties, so uh, there is a lot of scope. Coming back to the question on Charter Cities and Paul Romer's work, um, that has been very exciting, I think, and I've been reading that a lot. Hong Kong is an example of that, uh, but give yourself next five years. Probably he has a lot more to contribute to this area. And um, some of the things that he's saying really makes a lot of sense to me. Okay. Uh, a bit like uh, the, the idea of creative class, that could be created by the use of Charter City. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's very optimal. I think we want to be located where we think we can be more productive and creative and want to engage in similar type of a group of people. So that would be my take on that. Uh, th uh, thank you, uh, Humphrey, for the question. But before I start, I would just want to say about the pessimism. My pessimism is not about the Fijian economy per se. I think Fiji has a huge potential. And I have said that uh, it's a microcosm of a medium-sized economy. Uh, there are various sectors that, uh, that have potential. And I think we can do well. My pessimism is about bad policy making. It's not about the economy per se. Uh, on the productivity issue, uh, Humphrey, <coughs> there are two, two parts to this. One is the labor productivity. <clears throat> in 
and that's the one I was raising. <coughs> um, labor productivity is uh, is not on uh, to the par. Um, the the wage demands at the moment in the economy is way above the productivity level, <coughs> which is pinching on the businesses. And I think uh, there, there are ways to address that problem, basically through, um, uh, through uh, labor training uh, programs and uh, through better education system and so on. There's a long-term uh, long process to it, and there's also a short-term process to it, which, which can be achieved within, within you know, 12 months or, or so. So uh, government needs to get serious about that. <coughs> The, the second one is total factor productivity, which is more systemic. Uh, we need uh, better connectivity. We need uh, better systems in place. Uh, we need better management. All that combined would be able to give us uh, uh, a total factor productivity. Um, uh, a lot of major economies in the, in the world are actually banking on it. Right? When we talk about IT with new technologies, that's what it is about. <coughs> um, it's a bit far-fetched, maybe. But I think uh, technology is not too expensive. IT is not too expensive now in the world. So, um, so I think in the medium to long term, uh, Fiji needs to really think seriously about that. We, we can't keep on losing our labor because of low wages and so on. We have to hold them back. And it can only happen through, uh, through a good policies. Uh, not only the policies per se on that training and all that larger policies, bigger policies, broader policies, where we want, would want to hold people back. Uh, for instance, <clears throat> a better health sector, uh, better health services, which could be expensive, but older people would want to stay back, more experienced people, you know, middle-aged people want to stay back, that can, co they can contribute towards the management, towards the, you know, systemic gains that we want to realize. So that's how we go about it. Um, I, I guess I have answered your question. You, you always attend our updates, you know. Uh, <clears throat> on the tourism, uh, at the moment, the, the, the revenues from uh, the Chinese tourists is about one eighth, uh, sorry, uh, one sixteenth of the Australian earnings, earnings from the Australian tourists. So there's a long way to go. <clears throat> Nonetheless, uh, if we are talking about policies, I think we have to understand the Ch Chinese tourists, the Chinese tourism. And I guess it is more about high-end tourism. And, and Fiji is not so much geared towards that. And uh, that again needs policies, that again needs uh, investments. We need to attract high-end you know, investments uh, in that sector so we would be able to bank on you know, uh, uh, the, the growth that is taking place in China and, and, and rest of uh, Southeast Asia. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sunil. <coughs> Let's take two more questions. Um, we had one over here. Thank you. My name is uh, Marga Peters. I'm from the delegation of the European Union here in Suva. Uh, thank you for the presentations. Uh, very interesting. I had a question for the first two speakers um, about the data you're using because uh, it's very important to have good time series. And the first speaker was referring to GDP and ref saying that it was for the fiscal year, but the fiscal year changed here last year. Was How did you cope with that? How would you um, handle that issue? And then you, ha you were using, you were referring also to unemployment data. Do you have good information about labor supply? I'm just wondering because I'm here one year and I have not yet seen it. <laughs> so I was pleasantly surprised by this. Um, then for the second speaker, similar kind of question. You were using a solo model in which you use um, uh, capital stock, physical capital stock. How do you how do you deal with that data issue? Yeah, you need to you need to have time series on that. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, and a question here at the front. Please keep it short if you can. Uh, my name is Waka. I'm representing uh, the political party Sodelpa, and I'm a landowner. I have uh, three questions for all three. For the first Please one. Please do keep them short. <laughs> Mr. Rafik, uh, what is the government incentives for your cocoa farm industry? Is it the same thing like the water, the Fiji water, uh, for Fiji water taxation? Uh, Mr. Sunil, uh, we all know that remittance is an important uh, financial source. Uh, my question is on uh, brain drain. 
and it's now bearing fruit uh, to the engagement of the overseas uh, high profile, high salary um, in government posts and government institutions. Is this going to do something like Palau, where most of the money is going to go out instead of staying in the country? And uh, and for our for the urbanisation, what have you taken into effect uh, on the local uh, dilemma of villages uh, in the indigenous uh, settings? Urbanization's uh, effect on in the villages on an indigenous setting. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, so we might go in reverse order this time, and, and please, um, presenters, do keep your responses um, brief. So, Sunil, would you like to begin? Arif. Uh, Wanga, yeah. The yeah, the, uh, we are happy with the government incentives, uh, that the fact that they are uh, allocating uh, funding towards the revival of COCO. Uh, we just need to uh, want to have a more dialogue with them uh, for holistic revival. Their incentives, we are in the north, so I mean, uh, the subsidies uh, for loans for in the north through FDB, it's a tax-free, and we are working closely with them uh, on some of the training programs and uh, upgrade of facilities in the north to cater for the smallholder farmers. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, on the data issues, I think uh, if you're doing quantitative work in this part of the world, you will seriously feel a big pinch on your, um, on your analysis because of the quality of data. Um, physical capital stock data can be obtained from pen wall tables and uh, the ones that I've used um, is computed using perpetual inventory method. It's not very hard to do that. Once you know, uh, once you can anticipate the initial stock of capital, uh, you can account uh, using an appropriate measure of depreciation, which you normally take about 4% in growth counting exercises, and then you um, try to uh, adjust with the investments, uh, real investments taking place every year. So you can derive long time series data on that. Um, I've recently uh, had some experience of using the spend wall data, and I think, although they are not so comparable, but uh, if, you, if you use the two alternative data sets, the results, at least in this, won't uh, be too, too much diverse. Now, the effects of urbanization on rural setting, I could not really get what the question was, but I, but I would, uh, uh, would, would imagine that there has been increasing trend of, of indigenous people into uh, the, the city and towns as well. Um, particularly those who are highly educated and, of course, have got university degrees and stuff, because the uh, center of economic activity is in the city. Um, we, although we want to live in a sort of a free, uh, freestyle life in the rural area, um, I don't think many of us would want to stick there anymore. Um, that has been the case because of connectivity, because of the benefits that the city offers, and, and every other thing that we can imagine in the city. Um, I, for myself, live about seven kilometers away from the city center, but I don't want to be too far away because, and, and of course, I pay a high price to live in the city. For me, city is beneficial, even with the cost and congestions and whatever. And, and I think many of us feel the same. Otherwise, uh, the, the trend would have reversed. We'd have gone back. And of course, the city is the place where modernization uh, eventuates, and we want to be connected to that. So if I, I think if I'm reading you right, um, probably they, they need to go back, but I think they are increasingly wanting to stay in the city. If you look at the census uh, figures, um, the last one, you'll find their concentration in the city is also increased. So I don't know why, why we should think that they should go back. I mean, there's no, no way in which we can stop this process. It's very, very hard. We have tried in the past by putting in uh, funding and other kinds of investments in rural areas, but the rate of return on that has been very bad. I, I don't think we can stop people from, from coming into the city, whether it be indigenous or, or um, others. The story is same. Thank you, uh, Rup. <coughs> um, the question on the data, um, uh, I guess these days the data 
that we have uh, at the Bureau of States and the Central Bank actually is improving. Uh, there has been a lot of issues about that. Uh, we have been raising it in all different forums about it. I think uh, uh, the Bureau is doing well now. So GDP data also is much easier to collect. Um, they do quick surveys uh, through business houses and they are able to do estimates. <coughs> and, and time, and as it goes on, they keep do, doing their revisions. Uh, employment data is hard to come, but there are always some estimates. And I think they use uh, uh, provident fund data and some other data to actually do those estimates of unemployment and so on. Uh, but I don't think those are the best and the most reliable. I always have huge questions about it. Nonetheless, there's no other source, so we have to rely on the data to do our estimates. <coughs> uh, on the uh, remittance brain drain, who's gaining? Yes, I always say uh, <coughs> the source country loses. Um, there can be lots of arguments, but we see it in Fiji. We have lost so much uh, in terms of the economy, in terms of everything. Uh, best of our people have left to Australia, New Zealand, and the US. And some examples are sitting right in front of me. Uh, uh, professors and you know doctors and what and what not. Uh, while I was doing my PhD, I was on Bribe Island. And there, I met four or five doctors yeah, medical doctors who were actually from Fiji in a small place. And I realized why our health system is suffering so much. So indeed, when we're talking about migration, I don't think it's a real, real positive thing uh, for the sending uh, country. Uh, we have to do much more to retain those people, highly qualified, highly skilled people to contribute to the domestic economy. So that would be my answer. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, well, we're out Nonetheless, of time. Nonetheless, there are gains, sorry. There, there are gains um, in terms of attitudes, in terms of my Indian friends would know uh, when, when people who have made huge, huge, you know, capital in the Silicon you know, Valley out there in the U.S. actually are coming back and contributing. That is not the phenomena that we see out here so much. But Arif is one, one good example. Thank you. Exactly. All right, well, we're out of time, so apologies for... <laughs> Apologies for keeping you from your caffeine, but coffee is outside. Okay, so just some quick announcements before uh, break. Uh, some IT guys are here to help with the password if you're if you're having problems connecting, uh, and then again the evaluation forms, the pink sheets, we'll be collecting them at the end of the day, and yeah, coffee served outside for everybody. Please free to feel free to have coffee and morning refreshments. Thank you. Be back at the 11 o'clock for the first session for this morning. So we're going to the parallel sessions. <laughs>